class and today we'll be talking about market fragmentation. So as usual let us start with a quick recap of what happened last time. And in the past couple of weeks we have been looking at order-driven markets. Uh, we looked at Gloston's model or once again a very simple collection of examples that I collectively refer to as the Gloston's model. And uh, this model has taught us that limit traders act as liquidity providers and um, they act in a way similar to how dealer behaves but not quite the same, not quite the same way. Uh, we also took a quick look at Parler's model. Once again, not the actual Parler's model, but a very quick and simplified reinterpretation. And uh, that model concerned with traders' choice between limit orders and market orders. And that model has taught us that limit order book uh, has resiliency meaning that it is self-replenishing. So if limit order book is exhausted by market orders, if it is thin, then traders would be willing to supply limit orders instead of market orders and vice versa. Now, another thing we did uh, two weeks ago, or no, actually last week, uh, was uh, taking a quick look at market design. So not only did we look at how order-driven markets differ from dealer markets in terms of prices and um, depth a little bit and uh, actors' profits. But we also looked at a few aspects in which order-driven markets can differ from one another, like tick size, priority rules. Uh, we looked at hybrid markets with dealers and limit order book. And uh, we saw how market outcomes change across these dimensions. So the main lesson from there was that measures directed at improving liquidity can well backfire because they distort agents' incentives. And the main channel through which that happened was uh, that measures that improve liquidity quite often also decrease traders' profits, which uh, we argued verbally, decreases traders' incentives to participate in the markets. So what we'll do today is we will follow along this general um, uh, question of market design and uh, how should we organize our markets, financial and otherwise, and we will focus on one particular aspect, which is market fragmentation. So what we mean by market fragmentation, there are a few different ways in which you can understand it. Uh, we will say that it is the case when multiple markets are trading in the same asset. So selling the same asset is probably not the right formulation. Trading in the same asset would be a better way to say it. So we will explore costs and benefits that this fragmentation might bring and uh, I guess trade-offs that it might bring we will not really arrive to any particular conclusions. And um, so we will also use this as an excuse to revisit some of the models we have looked at previously, because I know you have already forgotten all of them, unless you have been doing the problem set, which once again, I strongly recommend you do. And uh, I have changed these slides and not updated this thing. Uh, we will not look that much at real-world regulation regarding market fragmentation, but I will give you a few bits and pieces of knowledge regarding uh, regulation, regarding how these markets are actually ruled in order to mitigate um, some of the inefficiencies that we will uh, look at. So seven minutes in, let's jump right into it. And uh, we'll start with a brief history lesson. In particular, is market fragmentation a thing that really happens in the real world? Is it something that we should care about? And the short answer is yes. So in the old times, uh, and here old times may mean different things depending on which assets you have in mind. You can think 1930s, you can think 1950s. 
uh, in some markets, we can think 1999. Uh, but in these old times, it was quite frequently the case that different assets were traded in different markets, and any given asset, any given stock or bond or options or any kind of other kind of derivative, was only traded in the one market that it was listed in. So if a stock was listed on a New York Stock Exchange, then all of the trading or almost all of the trading would happen on the new New York Stock Exchange and not on uh, Philadelphia Exchange and vice versa. Stocks listed at Philadelphia would not be traded in New York. Uh, the same was true for stock options until uh, the tip of the century, more or less. And yeah, options were only traded on the exchange where they were listed. In Europe, things were not that much different, so it, it was not only the case in the US. In Europe, uh, this setup, this layout, this way of organizing things was actually reinforced by local legislations. In particular, many European countries used to have laws and regulations that re said uh, that stocks of national companies, of companies that are registered in a given country, must be traded on the exchange, must be traded in that country, on one of the exchanges of that country. So stocks of Danish companies must be traded on one of the uh, Danish stock exchanges and not in London. But the dynamics of the past 20, 30, 50 years is that all of this is changing. So these days, uh, one way in, this, in which this is changing is that some stocks are cross-listed across uh, many exchanges. And uh, you can think, for example, Toyota or Sony were originally listed on uh, Japanese stock exchanges, probably Tokyo. But they, then they also um, went through the procedure of being listed at uh, NASDAQ. So cross-listing is actually quite an expensive procedure because in order to be listed at a given exchange, you must uh, fulfill all the requirements of that exchange, and that usually requires uh, transparency, some maybe some trading volumes. So even focusing on transparency, you must be willing to provide all your, or some amount of your financial reports, and preparing these financial reports for more than, for two different exchanges is usually uh, quite painful, because you have to do it in different languages, you have to do it according to different accounting regulations, different standards, uh, and so on. So cross-listing is an expensive procedure and uh, few companies actually do it, uh, go through it. But another way in which a stock can be traded on more than one exchange is um, what's called admitted for trading, being admitted for trading. And if you remember our first or second lecture, I asked you which exchanges are Microsoft stocks, Facebook stocks traded on, and uh, of course NASDAQ is the main one, but if you remember, I told you that they were also traded on a lot of European exchanges, for example, like Frankfurt, Berlin, uh, Milan, Zurich, Vienna, all of those, maybe even Copenhagen. But this does not mean that these stocks are listed in each and every one of these exchanges, because once again, listing is a tough procedure to go through. But the way this works is that these European exchanges basically say, well, you know, if this stock is good enough for NASDAQ, then it's good enough for us. So we will allow trading on our platform without requiring the company to go through this explicit procedure. And this is probably the main channel through which market fragmentation happens. So you no longer need to be listed at a given exchange in order to be traded at a given exchange. And these days, as compared to the old times, most stocks are traded on most exchanges. 
This is probably an exaggeration, but uh, that's the way to think about it. Policymakers have um, well, responded to this challenge. So once again, we will call fragmentation as uh, same stock being traded in multiple markets. And another dimension, uh, another way you can think about fragmentation that I've alluded to at the beginning is um, thinking that you know you have many, many, many markets, and in order to collect a good portfolio of assets, you have to trade in every single one of these markets. So in that sense, global global trading is fragmented. But this is not the way we look at it. So. In the way in which policy responded to this fragmentation is, um, well, try to artificially reduce it. So try to create some virtual consolidation, try to merge all of these many markets uh, into one or try to yeah, establish connections between them. One prominent way in which this happens is um, uh, the U.S. regulation, which uh, imposes order protection. Meaning, if, for example, uh, you have... An... No, you submit a market order to uh, NASDAQ, you want to buy an asset, but the best price at which this asset is sold, this stock is sold, is not on NASDAQ, but on one of the other exchanges, say in Pittsburgh, uh, then your order must be automatically routed by NASDAQ, by the exchange, to Pittsburgh. So if you submit a market order, it must be executed at the what's called national best bid or offer in this case. So in, the, uh, in this case, it will be national best offer. So even though the markets are actually fragmented, they have different limit order books, uh, they have different dealers which need not interact, when you submit a market order, it's almost as if you are acting against one unified uh, order book. Now, there are a few, of course, subtleties in that. There are many ways in which this can break, some of which are incorporated in the legislation, and we might talk about this a little bit um, a little later. Now, EU regulation um, does not really have anything like that. And once again, I'll say a few more words about how EU regulation works and what it requires uh, a few minutes later. Uh, but one dimension that we can already say is, uh, that we can already explore, is that EU regulation prohibited these countries' concentration rules. So I told you about these laws that require that uh, stocks of national companies must be traded on national exchanges. Uh, this is Laws like this are no longer allowed. So a country is not allowed to force its companies to uh, trade on any given exchanges. So in this sense, EU's uh, regulation probably fostered fragmentation. Not necessarily, because all trade could have converged to one big, big exchange, like LSE in London. Uh, but in some sense, you can think that it fostered fragmentation. So, yes, let us gradually move on to exploring the possible effects of fragmentation. One way in which uh, fragmentation affects markets, especially those with limit order books, is by violating priority rules established in those markets. So recall that we talked, uh, when we were talking about limit order books, we said that there can be different priority rules. The first one is quite often price priority, meaning that a trade, uh, if there are two limit orders, one of them offers a lower price or better price than another, meaning is... Um, is willing to sell for less or buy for more, then this better price offer is executed first of the two. That's usually the first priority in any given market, and that makes sense. Uh, for orders within, with the same price, 
There can be different second order priority rules. You can have time priority, meaning first come, first serve. First order, first limit order that was submitted for a given price will be executed first. <clears throat> and you also have visibility priority that we did not really talk about that much. But that is an interesting dimension uh, in, uh, in the actual world. And visibility priority relates to their being possibly visible and hidden limit orders. So everything that we've talked about so far is about uh, visible limit orders. One thing that you can actually do in the real world is to submit a hidden limit order. And that would not be visible to anyone who is looking at the limit order book. But if anyone submits a market order, then this uh, hidden order would execute against that market order. There is usually a visibility priority in place, in the sense that visible orders are executed before the hidden orders for a given price. And this might precede or come after a time priority. So what fragmentation does, or can do, is it can lead to violations of each and every single one of these priority rules. So if there are two limit orders at the same price, one of them uh, is on exchange A and it's visible, another one is on exchange B and it's hidden, and market order is submitted to exchange B, then visibility priority will be uh, violated because uh, a hidden order will be executed before a visible order. And I realize now that what's written here is the opposite. You've got hidden on A and visible on B. Um, speaking of time priority, it works exactly the same way. You have um, an order on market A that was entered later than on market B at the same price. But if a market order is submitted to market A, then um, this late limit order will be executed before that earlier limit order. So time priority can be violated. And there might even be cases in which price priority is violated. If, if uh, order protection rules are not in place, and if traders are not really searching carefully enough, because they do want to get the best price. They do not care about time or visibility, really, as long as they get the price, but they do care about price, per se. Uh, so if they did not find the best price among all markets available to them, then they may submit a market order to an exchange that does not have the best price. And this would violate price priority, and this is something we really don't like. And this is part of the reason why... Um, Order protection rules are in place in the US and some of the similar rules are in place in the EU. So apart from priority violations, what else can happen? What, el what are other possible consequences of um, fragmentation? Well, for one, you can think that it becomes more difficult to search for the best price if you have one market and one limit order book, then the best price is shown almost automatically, right? If you have many different markets, it becomes more difficult to search for the best price. So it uh, manifests in higher trading costs for the traders. Secondly, once you have many, many different fragmented markets and information about the assets real uh, fundamental value is dispersed among all these markets, across all these markets. Meaning informed traders just try to um, split their trading across many different markets so that their information is less visible. What this may lead to is worse price discovery. So price in any single one of these exchanges will reflect the fundamental value of the asset to a lesser extent. It will be further away from the fundamental value. 
And furthermore, you can have total liquidity of all these markets combined being less than the liquidity of one consolidated market. And this relates to network effects. This, is, this relates to uh, what we called liquidity begets liquidity. Meaning, if the traders know that the asset is liquid, that it will be easier to sell the asset in the future, then that they would be more willing to buy the asset today. So the more liquid is the asset, the more willing are different traders to participate in the market for this asset. And so if you have many small, relatively illiquid markets, then tr traders would be less willing to participate in this market in, a, in aggregate, in average. So it seems like fragmentation is uh, pretty damn bad, right? Well, you can look at it this way, or you can look for the upside. So trading costs might actually be lower in fragmented markets, because instead of one exchange, you have a lot of many different exchanges and platforms, and they would compete with each other, decreasing each other's order processing costs, uh, such as order submission costs, execution costs, clearing and settlement fees, and so on. So the fiercer is the competition, the lower are actually these order processing costs, which we saw to be one of the very significant components of uh, the spread. And secondly, it is true that information will be dispersed across many different markets, but what it also means is you will have many different signals about the price of the asset. You will have many different prices to make your inference from, rather than just one price. So, the larger is the sample size, the better is the inference, right? If you took econometrics or statistics, you would know that. Which means that we might actually have better price discovery with um, fragmented markets, because we have more sample points to build our inference from. Finally, uh, oh, sorry for that. Finally, it might be the case that the fragmented markets provide greater total liquidity just uh, due to all the same reasons that we discussed last week. Because if you have many, if, sorry, if all the liquidity providers split across many different markets, rather than all competing in the same market, then they would get larger profits on average, you would think, they would have more market power. And this would mean that uh, being a liquidity provider would be more profitable, more prestigious. So traders would be more willing to become liquidity providers, which means that there might be more total liquidity provision in all of the market. So, as you see, things are not quite clear-cut, just like they never are. So, we, what we will do today, for the rest of today, is we will look at some of these, most of these, and some other uh, consequences of liquidity in greater detail. So, we will start with discussing trading costs in greater detail, um, just because there is not that much more to say about them beyond what I already said. So let's start with the upside, with the idea that fragmentation can reduce uh, trading costs. And this stems from the very, very, very basic idea that competition drives prices down. And in case of exchanges, the price of a service that exchange provides is the order processing costs for the traders. And sometimes you do not even need explicit competition, even just the threat of entry of a competitor is enough. And here is one uh, particular case that we can look at that illustrates the point very clearly. So, oh, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so this case relates to stocks of Dutch companies which before 2003 were only traded on a single exchange. 
and this was uh, NSC, you know, which belongs to Euronext. And Euronext has a lot of different exchanges in Europe. And by now it's also merged with the New York Stock Exchange. So it is a huge conglomerate. But they have a lot of different platforms and NSC is or was one of them. And um, that was the only place where stocks of Dutch companies were traded. That was until 2000, 2003. And in May of that year, two other big conglomerates, sorry, Yeah, apologies. Um, two other big conglomerates, two other big European exchanges, namely Deutsche Börse and uh, the London Stock Exchange, announced that they want to launch their own trading platforms for stocks of Dutch companies. And it's interesting to see what happened to the order entry fee on Euronext around these times. So. The announcement was made in May 2003, but the actual entry only happened uh, a year later in May 2004, when London Stock Exchange launched its uh, platform Eurosets. Now, in January 2004, a few months before the launch, the order entry fee, so the fee that you have to pay for uh, your order to get displayed on the exchange, was uh, 30 euro cents. In April, just a couple of months before the launch of Eurosets, this order entry fee was uh, halved, was divided by two, for limit orders in the exchange, which is a pretty sizable discount, right? In May of 2004, on the launch day of LSE, this order entry fee was completely waived for all market orders on Euronext, or I guess not yet waived, but temporarily suspended, like a sale. But in January 2005, so a bit over a half a year later, all order entry fees on Euronext were completely waived for all market and limit orders. So this price decrease took a lot of steps, but uh, it was pretty sizable in the end especially given that Euronext has also reduced its uh, order execution fees. So, order entry fee is what you pay before the trade, when you have, want to display your order on the exchange. Execution fee is what you pay when your order is actually hit. The fun part in all of that is that this competing exchange, Eurosets, never really gained much traction. Well, probably at least partly due to this aggressive strategy of uh, Euronext. But uh, so the textbook says that Eurosets had a peak market share at around 6% and then it waned down uh, ever lower since then. And this peak was very soon after launch. And uh, it's, I'm not even sure if it exists to this day because I could not find any information on this Eurosets. So it might have um, been driven out of existence by competition. But this story, just in general, illustrates uh, the big point about competition, driving down prices, which is good for the traders, which is good for market efficiency. So the flip side of the coin, as we discussed, is that market fragmentation induces surge costs for the traders. And the thing about this is that traders do not even really participate in the market directly. So if I want to buy a stock, I do not go to the exchange. I go to a bank, to a broker, and tell them that I want to buy a stock, and they buy it on my behalf. So what happens is, I ask a bank to buy me a stock, then the bank should surge the market for the best price to buy me a stock and then, well, actually buy it. This surge is quite a non-trivial procedure. So you would think, how difficult can it be? Just look at a few prices. There cannot be more than maybe a dozen, right? 
how many big exchanges are there? Just look at a dozen prices and pick the best one. Well, you know, all of these markets have different depth. You can also have various crossing networks where depth might not even be displayed. You might have hidden orders that we talked about that you cannot really see, that you can only guess about. And then you can also have dark pools of liquidity, which are not observable, but which uh, might provide some liquidity. So instead of going to the market, the bank can actually go to, say, another bank and ask them if they want to trade directly. So search is uh, not an easy task. And once you realize that it, this is not a static problem, but rather all these markets are always dynamic, scam, 100%. Absolute, absolute scam. To those of you on YouTube, I was responding to Twitch chat. Uh, yes, so, where was I? Yes, search is really non-trivial, and once you take into account that this, all of these markets are really dynamic, that they change every few seconds, new, new orders come and go, prices change, search is really difficult, and it's costly, right? That's the point. But, there is a subtle problem. The cost of this search is incurred, incurred by the bank. So the bank has to search for the best price on my behalf. While all the savings that I get from the best price, um, I actually get. So the bank gets nothing from providing a better price uh, for me, from finding a better price for me. And this creates um, an agency problem between the broker and the trader. So their incentives are misaligned and we have to find some way to make the broker behave, to incentivize the broker to search. So what? Uh, one way to do is to do this are some performance-based contracts. Sorry. And um, so basically, if trader has a long-running relationship with the broker, the trader can compensate the broker for finding good prices. But the question is, how do you even realize what a good price is? How do you evaluate what is the benchmark for the price being good? Right? Because to find the, the good, the best price, and to compare this best price to the price that you actually got as a trader, to the price at which the broker has executed your order, you as a trader have to do this whole search which is, once again, a costly activity. So performance-based contracts are difficult to implement. And, um, oh yeah, there's actually another source of conflict between the broker and trader. There's not just this misappropriation of costs and gains, or this wedge between who pays the cost and who gets the gain, but there might also be... Um, distortion of incentives for the brokers by the exchanges. So exchanges might pay brokers for directing the order flow towards this exchange, for routing all of the orders that brokers receive through this particular exchange. So it can be either a payment for all of the order flow, if the exchange tries to build up momentum, tries to accumulate trading volume so that it can advertise and attract other traders by saying, look, we have such a huge trading volume, you should come trade with us. Or alternatively, this payments, these payments can uh, come for directing only particular orders towards this exchange and all other orders towards other exchanges. For example, the exchange might want the broker to give all orders from retail investors from the uninformed, relatively, investors because the exchange is likely to profit on them. And the exchange can ask the broker to direct all orders from large professional institutional traders who are informed to other exchanges. 
So these payments for order flow are quite a sizable problem and they might um, affect brokers routing decisions quite significantly. And this is another source of agency problem. So how do we solve this problem, this misalignment of incentives? Well, I already told you about this order protection rules in the US, which make the search quite easy, right? These rules say that, well, you can submit your order anywhere and it will be executed at the best price. So the intent is there. Um, it only really works well for small orders because once you uh, once your huge market order depletes that nation best uh, order, it will have to climb up the book or it can be routed in any way the broker wants it to. So only the kind of the best order at any given moment is protected. But once you deplete it, um, yeah, the, the protection rules do not apply anymore. Another way in which order protection rules can break is by not incorporating um, exchange fees. So the way these rules work, I, you know what, I actually found an example that you might relate to. So that took me some time to find it, but uh, this is eBay. These are a few listings for the same monitor. Uh, and you can see that the prices are slightly different. But the twist is that the listing with the best price charges you a lot for shipping. While if you're ready to accept slightly worse price, well, you save on shipping by an order of magnitude. And the total cost of this order will actually be lower. So the same happens on the exchanges. Trade protection only works um, based on the listed price of the asset. So this would be the price. Uh, this would be the protected order uh, according to the protection rules. And um, they do not take into account the fees that the exchange charges on top of the listed price. So this is one way in which order protection rules can break. Or I guess the second way after uh, not, being, not working well for large orders. The final way in which order protection rules may break is if uh, tick size is different across exchanges, say one exchange, exchange A for Amsterdam, no, it's the US, so Arkansas, uh, all uh, has a tick size of one cent and exchange B in um, whatever, Brooklyn, charges, uh, has tick size of one tenth of a cent, so smaller tick size. Then Given any price in Arkansas, Ar Arkansas, I don't even know how to pronounce it. Maybe I should not do it. So given any price on exchange A, exchange B or traders on exchange B can always set that price minus one tenth of a cent. So just undercut it by a little bit. And uh, traders on exchange A will not be able to engage in this undercutting war because their tick size is just way too large. Undercutting is very costly for them. Uh, but the regulation actually accounts for it. And from what I believe, the US regulation mandates that all exchanges participating in this um, order protection system, national, national something system, I can't remember, it's called. All exchanges participating in that system must have a tick size of, I think, at least one cent. So there, there is some regulation on tick size. Huh. Uh, so this was US regulation that tries to tackle the agency problem that we have. In Europe, there is no strict order protection legislation. So there is no rule that strictly enforces order protection. But 
there are what's called best execution rules imposed on brokers. And uh, what they say, the way they are formulated, approximately, is they say a broker should execute the client's order in the, um, in the best reasonable way or at the best price that can be reasonably found. So something like that. It is somewhat vaguely formulated, but it does not tie everything to just price. So not only price matters, but it allows brokers to account for the fees, it allows brokers to account for execution times, it allows uh, brokers to just take other factors into account when they, uh, when they are choosing how to route a trader's order. So this was it for trading costs. It's, um, there are two different aspects of trading costs, and it's really difficult to compare them in principle, because it will all depend on the particular trading environment, on the particular um, real market circumstance. So, so there is not much we can say more, uh, not much more we can say in abstract about trading costs. But if we go back to this slide, what we will do now for the rest of today is we will resort back to our familiar models and we will try to see whether fragmentation results into better or worse price discovery and more or less depth and liquidity um, within these models. And what we will start with is the Kyle model that we all know and love. So I realize that it's been a couple of weeks since we've looked at the Kyle model. So before we take a break, let us take a quick refresher of how Kyle model actually worked, uh, how we solved it. So in the baseline Kyle, Kyle model in uh, what? Two, three weeks ago, we had one risky asset with a fundamental value V, which was distributed according to a normal distribution with some mean and variance. We had three types of agents in our market. We had one insider or speculator or informed trader, and this trader observed V perfectly and decided how big of a market order to place uh, in order to maximize their profit from trading. The noise trader or liquidity trader just had some random demand, U, which was also normally distributed. And uh, so this demand was not in any way correlated with the asset value V. Finally, we had a market maker or a dealer who observed aggregate order flow Q. So this was in a sense a model of the call market. Uh, the dealer has is accumulating orders over some period of time and then executing them all at once. So market maker observes aggregate order flow Q and decides on the price at which to execute all of these orders. Equivalently, the market maker can uh, propose some pricing schedule of prices and quantities before observing the quantity. So this is an equivalent formulation. We, are, we have assumed for the most part, I can't remember if we did the model with imperfectly competitive dealers or maybe you did it at home. I cannot remember to be honest. But in the baseline model, we have assumed that market makers are competitive. So they operate at zero profit and they price their assets uh, according to the expected fundamental value of the asset conditional on all the information they have, which is the order size. So the way we solved this model uh, was first by assuming that the informed trader uses a linear strategy, in particular that his order size X is proportional to the distance between V and the Exante expected fundamental value, mu, exante expectation of the fundamental value. 
and the proportionality coefficient is some beta. And then we assumed that you can derive, or because I skipped the derivation, but it's it's not really an assumption in the model, so it's something we can derive. Uh, but the point is, we end up with also a linear pricing schedule, meaning that the market price P, at which the whole order is executed, is um, linear in the total order size Q with some coefficient, slope coefficient lambda. So once we have two of these, two of these equations highlighted here, uh, we can almost solve for the model. So the only unknown parts remaining at this point are beta and lambda. And these would be our equilibrium parameters. So we can solve for lambda given beta from the more detailed expression that we had for the price. So in particular, we said that lambda is covariance over variance. And we derived this expression for the lambda coefficient that generates zero profits for the dealer. And then given this lambda, we solved the insider's problem, the informed trader's problem. So this profit maximization problem given lambda. And we ended up with exactly linear pricing schedule, sorry, linear trading strategy X. And we have found beta as a function of lambda. So the final step that we needed to do is to combine these two conditions with each other. And they would allow, allow us to solve for beta and lambda simultaneously. So that's what we do. And we end up with this solution. So we can express both lambda and beta in terms of uh, parameters of the model, namely in terms of sigmas, um, variance of u, and variance of uh, v. So then we can plug all this into the model. And one more aspect that I want to emphasize that we can do in the baseline model is we can compute uh, the profit of the speculator, which is equivalently the loss of the uninformed trader, the average trading cost. And we can yes, just compute it. And what we would obtain is given by this expression. So it will be proportional to sigma v times sigma u. So this was the baseline model. What we will do now is we will say that there is not just one market, but two markets in which this trading happens. But we will do so after the break. So let us take five minute break right here and we'll be right after that.